so James will join us on stage. He's the CEO of Acme Gating and also project lead for Zool. So welcome. Uh, hi, my name is Jim. Um, I'm going to be talking about simultaneous dependencies with Zool. Um, basically, this is uh, uh, there. There have been some new developments in Zool recently, and I kind of want to share what we've been doing there. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Zool since we've we've also um, launched headfirst earlier into a, into a talk about Zool. And uh, I don't know if everybody knows what Zool is, so um, I figured maybe I'll I'll take a minute and and share that a little bit. So uh, Zool is a project gating system that we developed originally for the OpenStack project. Um, I started it uh, 12 years ago at the end of this month. Um, I think May 29th is 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 our birthday, so it's been out there for a, a little while there. Uh, like I said, it was originally started for OpenStack and, and was designed specifically for its needs. Uh, and then it turns out that um, lots of different people from different organizations trying to collaborate on projects that need to work together is not a unique thing. Um, that happens all over the place and other people started using it too. So Zool is, is spread beyond OpenStack. It's now used by a number of other open source projects and internally by uh, quite a few companies. So um, I'm the project lead and uh, I continue to help maintain the project uh, with a number of other people in the community. And uh, about three years ago, I started a company called Acme Gating so that I could work full time on Zool helping uh, companies use Zool and scale it effectively. So if you're thinking about using Zool or you do already, please talk to me. Um, so why are people interested in using Zool? And I'm sorry, there's a, this is my spike mark, I should stand here. Um, so here's, here are a few reasons people might want to use Zool. Um, I'm gonna actually go into each of these uh, uh, just a little bit. Um, so the first is, that is a new background for this slide. Um, this is, this is. Um, it's AI generated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel like I've seen this somewhere before. So um, uh, uh, Zool is uh, entirely Git driven. So uh, uh, the, the concepts of Git are entirely central to Zool, uh, including the, the um, uh, the triggers for the workflow pipelines, uh, those are all based on Git events. Um, uh, the, the configuration of Zool itself is uh, encoded in Git. Um, and all of this means that you can have your, uh, your code and your CI infrastructure or even your deployment infrastructure all uh, in, in changes uh, that are you can commit them together or in a series of changes that are related. Um, uh, there's some pretty neat things you can do. Uh, it has this Goldilocks control model, right? So uh, if you have, uh, say, some centralized requirements for your CI system that you, you, you have some auditing you need to do or compliance or something like that, you can, you can absolutely enforce this from, uh, from with a centralized control, or you can developer, let developers sort of do their own thing, or really anywhere in between. It's all just a matter of which Git repositories you put this configuration in. Is it a repository that's managed by a central team, or is it a repository that's managed by developers? Um, Zool has a concept called project gating, which is not something that was really widely um, seen before Zool. There, there are a couple of predecessors out there, but I, I think Zool is what really brought it to the forefront of, of the conversation. And so if we look at the, the, the history of CI in, in one slide, um, the, the term CI, meaning continuous integration, was popularized by the Hudson Project, which we now call Jenkins. And uh, originally what it was doing was testing uh, basically, every time, every time somebody would merge a change to the, I don't know, subversion repository or CVS or something like that, um, 
then uh, Hudson would kick off a build and, and, and integrate that change and see if, uh, see if the product still worked. So you were testing the past. You were, you were testing, uh, did th this thing that I just merged, did it break the build? Um, people eventually realized, like, oh, actually, you know, we could, we could run the test before we merge it. We could actually just check out the, the change that's been proposed and, and test that. Uh, and so at that point, I feel like the world of CI was testing the present. Um, Zool goes a step further, and it, uh, it tests the future. It is testing not only this change as the developer wrote it, it's testing the change as it will be merged into the repository, even if the repository has moved on since the developer wrote it, even if there are other changes that Zool knows are going to be merged ahead of this particular change. It will include those as well. So it's all about testing the future and how far in the future you want to go is entirely up to you. Um, so the way that we uh, uh, achieve this is we, we, we started with a really naive approach. Say somebody would uh, send, say that five changes were ready to be merged and they'd, they'd approve all five and they'd go to the CI system. We'd put them in a queue and, and test them one at a time and merge them, right? Um, that's pretty slow. So we started doing this thing with optimistic speculative execution where um, let's say changes one and two, um, they pass their test, we merge them, right? Uh, while, while that was going on, we're already testing change number three and four and five. Um, and let's say change number four started failing its tests. At that point, we know it's not gonna merge. We move it out of the queue. Um, we rebase number five on number three and we try to keep things moving. Um, and so Zool will sort of continuously reshuffle the contents of the queue as, uh, as changes appear to be passing or failing to, to, uh, to keep all these jobs running in parallel and keep the pipeline moving as quickly as possible. Um, we realized that, that those changes didn't need to be in the same project. We could build these queues uh, out of multiple projects. And this was a, a key thing for the OpenStack project because OpenStack had a bunch of different parts that all needed to work together. Um, and so we ended up with these sort of cross repository dependencies. We'd, um, you know, if we compare to our last slide here, uh, those two changes at the top could be in a library and then there could be a front end change that uses that library and, and so forth. So um, we're, we're kind of building up this, this complexity uh, as we go in terms of what Zool is able to, to look ahead and start testing. Um, we started off with these dependencies being um, either uh, explicitly defined because they're, they're Git parents and, and children or they're just happenstance of the order that people enqueued them into pipelines. But uh, then we built this thing on top of it. We added uh, the ability for developers to explicitly specify changes that depend on other changes. So uh, by adding this depends on footer to the bottom of a, of a git commit message, you could say this change depends on this other change. And it doesn't have to be in the same repository. It could be in a different project. Um, and, and so we're, we're, we're now sort of letting developers um, construct this proposed future state of the world out of multiple git commits to multiple repositories, and they're doing it explicitly um, by, by uh, linking changes together with this uh, depends on footer. And so you can end up with a process where you can build entire speculative systems. Um, you, can, you could say, um, hey, I, I want, I'm gonna change this library and then I'm gonna build a front end on top of it. And then I wanna deploy the entire stack. And you can specify that you want all of those things to happen in changes that you've pushed up for code review. And Zool can make all of that happen and, and actually deploy a, a, a system uh, based on all of these changes, this proposed future state of the world before any of them merge. So it's a super powerful way for, for developers to work. And um, uh, I actually will be talking a little bit more about that use case specifically uh, later on today. Um, so we, 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 we had this idea that like, oh, well, you could, you could link changes between different projects then we realized the projects didn't even need to be in the same code review system. There's, there's kind of this, um, 
base level of functionality that all the code review systems provide. We abstracted in Zool to some extent, and now you can have changes in a project that hosted in Garrett that depend on a change in GitHub or GitLab or something like that, which turns out to be surprisingly useful um, because not only is it very common in large organizations to have different teams that are sort of, they have their own focus, but yet need to, I don't know, let's say all of their code needs to run in the same car at the end of the day. Um, that's not, not only is that the case, but sometimes those teams will have their own preferences for code review systems. So you might have uh, a, a development team that works in Garrett and another one that works in GitLab. And you can actually um, bring them together under one roof, under one CI system uh, with Zool uh, because of this cross-source dependency. So they really, they have no excuse to not be talking to each other anymore and testing their code together. Um, you put all these things together and you don't need a monorepo. Um, I talk to a lot of people that have a monorepo and um, you ask them why, and they're like, well, it's because of the CI system. That my, my CI system doesn't, doesn't, like how else could I test all these things together? And um, Zool gives you the freedom to not have a monorepo if you don't want it. You can have a monorepo with Zool, that's great. Um, but if, if the only reason you were thinking of doing that or the only reason you do is that, um, is, is because of this, how do I get different components to work to, with each other uh, problem, um, Zool can help solve that and, uh, and, and basically there's the, the cross repo dependencies thing lets those different um, repositories work together as if they were uh, in the same way as a monorepo, right? And there's a couple of different ways that, that you can accomplish this. You can do it with library relationships. That's sort of the most straightforward and universal way of, of doing it. That's what OpenStack does. Um, you can have uh, microservices, basically using the network as a way to um, get these components talk, to talk to each other, or you can use submodules. Um, there are dragons there as there always are with submodules, but um, there are uh, certainly um, some things that you can do with that and, uh, and, and, um, and yeah. So I've talked a little bit about dependencies so far uh, and all of the dependencies that I've been talking about are sort of implicitly linear dependencies. And that's because in Zool, when we started, um, uh, when we started this, this whole idea of, of managing dependencies in Zool, uh, we were focused on the OpenStack project. And uh, the OpenStack project enforced linear dependencies between components um, by design. That was an explicit choice, and that's because OpenStack wanted to support continuous deployment. And the idea that uh, you'd be able to upgrade, um, uh, you know, even, even every commit that landed to OpenStack, you could deploy. And so you might have the, the Nova Compute component upgrading to a commit, and then the Keystone component upgrading to the next commit. And whether, whether or not actually public clouds ended up doing that or not is um, uh, a, a varied story, but um, the idea was there at least in theory, and certainly that kind of um, linear progression made things easier for, for um, uh, for supporting that idea of continuous deployment. Even if at some point, sometimes it made it a little harder for developers. Sometimes developers would say, oh, well, I don't want to put in the backwards compatibility handling to, to be able to do that. And, and we'd say, well, sorry, like the CI system won't actually merge your change unless you do that. Uh, so um, it, was, it was useful for that. But um, then as Zool started to um, be used by folks outside of OpenStack, um, they started to push back a little bit. Uh, we said, of course, you should be using linear dependencies because you want to continuously deploy things, right? And they said, well, actually, no, what we do is we update everything in the car at once. We don't continuously deploy every commit to every part of the car. Uh, and we said, oh, yeah, well, that's, we have no rejoinder for that. That, that, that makes perfect sense. So um, thus, Zool started supporting circular dependencies. Um, it's an option, so we have it disabled um, uh, for OpenStack, but quite a few uh, people that I work with uh, outside of OpenStack 
um, they, they do use circular identities. And, um, and so, um, and, and I'm, I'm a couple different terms here, right? Circular dependencies, simultaneously, simultaneous dependencies. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of things in Zool um, where I, I said all of the code re review systems provide a basic level of functionality. Quite often, Garrett goes one step beyond, uh, and, and it does that here as well. Uh, Garrett actually natively has the idea of circular dependencies in it. And so if, if your code review system is Garrett, um, uh, Garrett has this idea of changes having a topic, and there's a flag you can turn on in Garrett called submit whole, to whole topic. And if you have that enabled, um, Garrett's going to assume that all of the changes in that topic should merge at the same time atomically. And so Zool recognizes that, and it will see that if you have circular dependencies enabled in Zool, and you have submit whole topic enabled in Garrett, it will, it will go and look at all of the dependencies in that topic, and it will create a cycle out of them and test them as a circular dependency. If you're not using Garrett, that's fine. Um, you, you just create the cycle the old-fashioned way by hand by using those depends on headers. Um, so when, when we first added um, uh, circular dependencies to Zool, we were still working with the original framework that we had in Zool, which is uh, one change at a time. And what we did is, is if you enqueued a circular dependency into Zool um, and you looked at the status page, this is actually what you'd see. You'd, you'd see two different changes and one would be after the other. And it, it would look like a linear dependency, but behind the scenes, we actually made a, like there's an arrow pointing back to the first one as well to make a cycle. So um, it was a little weird in that we were presenting something to the user that wasn't exactly what was happening behind the scenes and, and you had to kind of understand that that was what was going on. The other thing that was a little bit weird about it is that um, you can imagine if you're, dealing with circular dependencies, it's because there's some very close relationship between two components. And, um, and you might be running the same jobs. And so with this system where we would enqueue the two different changes one after the other, um, we would end up running duplicative jobs because we'd have to run the jobs for the first change and then run the same jobs for the second change. Even though the jobs would actually have the same content, they'd both be checking out both repositories with both changes. Um, the, the framework that we had, uh, that we had inherited basically, uh, meant that we had to run the job twice. So that was a little bit wasteful. Um, so the thing that we've been doing over the past six months or so um, that has finally landed in Zool version 10 uh, is to refactor, to sort of um, treat, it, we actually, we inverted it. Instead of uh, linear dependencies being the, the, the conceptual default in Zool, we flipped it so that circular dependencies are now the conceptual default and linear dependencies are a special case of that. From a programming point of view, that makes a lot more sense. It's better to have your special case be a simplification of the, the complex thing rather than the other way around. Um, so, but that's what we did is we refactored it. And that lets us do all kinds of things like really smart automatic job deduplication. So Zool, if you enable all this stuff, Zool will automatically based on the contents of the jobs because it knows what it's checking out, um, and the job configuration, because it knows what the job is going to run, it will decide whether it can automatically deduplicate that job uh, and, and combine them. So there are a couple of edge cases where this doesn't work automatically. Um, both of them are really the same thing, and that is if your job does something other than just look at the repo content. So if your job does something like, if it lints the commit message, then Zool isn't gonna know, it, Zool doesn't think that the commit message is part of the content, so you need to tell it, Okay, don't deduplicate that because I need to lint both commit messages. Or on the flip side, if you have a job that just say runs container images that aren't actually built from the repos because they're pulled down from somewhere else, Zool isn't necessarily going to know that that could be duplicated. So in that case, you tell it, yes, de do deduplicate that. But other than those edge cases, almost all the time it's going to do the right thing and, um, and automatically uh, deduplicate these jobs for you. So this is what a circular dependency looks like today. You take those same two changes 
Um, they, and what Zool does is it enqueues them both in one queue item um, and then runs jobs uh, that may apply to one or both of those. So in this case, Zool, um, uh, it did not deduplicate the linter's job because if you've got two different changes to two different repositories, you still need to lint each of those changes, right? So we run that job twice. Um, one of the changes builds a Zool image, one of the changes builds a node pool image, so we run each of those jobs. And then the quick start job, if we go back here, that was the one that, that was needlessly duplicated. Um, here we only run it once. So, um, and this can, can all be done automatically. Uh, those numbers that I put up there, the, those really long random looking numbers, those are real changes in the OpenDev system. Uh, if you go to review.opendev.org and look up those change numbers, you'll, you will see a couple of test changes that I made uh, with a circular dependency um, in, in OpenDev, just basically to demonstrate this to the, the, the community, which might not otherwise see it um, because of all the, the OpenStack linear dependency stuff going there. But if you go there and you look at these changes in Zool, this is what you'll see. Um, so uh, this is what a build set result looks like for a build set with more than one change in it. Uh, you can see up in the top left, uh, we, we've got both the Zool and the node pool change up there. Um, this is basically just the same slide I showed you. It's the job list. Um, this is abbreviated slightly. Uh, there, there are actually more jobs that we run for, for these two projects, um, but those are the, the, the critical things. Um, and here, here is a non-deduplicated job, right? So here is, um, we're running the linters job for the Zool project. You'll notice that it's actually the first of the two changes listed. And if you go to the node pool version of that job, um, the order is flipped. So, so there's a, uh, it's, it's still a little subtle, maybe we should make it less subtle, but there's still an idea of a primary change that is used, that is sort of what's driving each particular job. And in the case of a non-deduplicated job, that concept is still important. So we, we, we tell you what that is. Um, so in summary, um, simultaneous dependencies are cool. You don't need a mono repo, you get automatic job deduplication, and you can effectively test many changes together as a unit. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Zool, there's a website at zoolci.org, or more about what I do, visit acmegating.com. And I think we have maybe a couple minutes if there are any questions. All right. Thanks. Cool, uh, thank you. Um, were there any questions? I see one hand, and let's try, you can try to throw the oh, thing. Oh, no, 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 no okay. please, you. <laughs> <laughs> this is not as much of a question as a thank you. For the first time, I actually understand what Sewell does really well. <laughs> Well, there's now one person in this room, so that's great. You can tell everybody else. <laughs> so thank you. So I had one question, and, and if there's any other questions, please stop me. But as someone was alluded to, like introducing Zool was one big step, and introducing, uh, uh, I lost the name, is another step in order to educate the developers, etc. Would you say that yeah, you Basil, have it? Basil, yes, yes, precisely. Mm -hmm. So do you see it as a, as a, okay, how do you see having a monumental complexity that Zool potentially could solve for you, or you start with Zool even if you have a non-complex environment, or, or how, do you, how do you see that? It's, uh, it's always easier if you can get in at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, Zool scales up and down really well. So if you're, if, if, uh, you, you saw earlier an instance of Zool that runs 20,000 jobs per day. That's on the big side. Um, uh, Zool can handle running one job per day uh, just as well. Um, you, all of the components, like you can run it on your laptop, right? So if you're if you're starting if you're starting a project and you want to, uh, you have the opportunity to get something like Zool in there at the beginning, then I would recommend it um, because you and Zool can grow together. Um, having said that, lots of people aren't in that position. And, uh, and even, weirdly, 
OpenStack wasn't in that position twice. OpenStack, you know, we, we developed Zool after, like, uh, as you heard, two years after OpenStack started. Um, they, they did kind of grow up together, but there was still a migration, an initial migration. And then there was another migration when we redesigned Zool version three. Um, and and um, I think those are, we can take lessons from those. And um, we, we took sort of an incremental approach where what we did was we, we, we took what, what we had and simplified it as much as possible. We said like, what was, what was in common between the old and the new systems? Can we simplify it down to that, um, then make the transition with that and then start scaling up the new one? And that was actually, that was a really good exercise because it, it meant that we, we sort of, and, and what we were doing is we were moving from Jenkins to Zool uh, originally, and then moving from Zool version two to version three. Uh, and, and what we did was, was in both cases, we, we got rid of a lot of the cruft that we had built up. You know, we'd kind of, we'd grown to use lots of weird features in Jenkins that weren't, like we didn't really need. Um, and, and so um, it, was, it was a good exercise to, to do that simplification. And we sort of developed good habits to, to not necessarily um, use every shiny thing that, that would then make it difficult to, for us to make um, uh, transitions in the future. So. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, there's one oh, way over there. Oh yeah, that's definitely, I'm definitely not throwing that one. <laughs> You've got better liability insurance. Yes, uh, so when uh, avoiding to run the same job twice, how exactly is the content, uh, how, how, is, how do you determine that two jobs have the same um, content? Can they be deduplicated? Um, so Zool has uh, the idea of um, required projects for a job. So when, when you define a job in Zool, you can say that this job also needs to check out these other projects. And so if you have a job um, with, uh, that specifies required projects, then Zool is going to assume that all of the, all of the projects uh, that that job uses, that it's the same set of projects, right? So that's sort of, that's a heuristic that it, that it uses to determine like, oh, well, well uh, if there's a job with these required projects, then it's probably a multi-project integration job. And those are the ones that are safe to deduplicate. If it doesn't list the required projects, then that means it's a job that's designed to only test the change, uh, that the project under test. Um, so in other words, it's, a, it's like a linter job. It, it runs against whatever the project is. Um, and so those are, it assumes are not safe to deduplicate. There's a little bit more logic than that, but that's the gist of it. And I think the documentation goes into, into a bit more detail, but that's, that's kind of how it, it, it understands what the content of the, the project workspace is and what the job configuration is. Thank you. I was a bit confused. I thought mm -hmm. that we were deduplicating de at sort of the, the, either the change ID and, and patch set level, but it's on the job level, so. Thank yep, you. yep, it's the job level, so. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's, it's don't run integration jobs twice is uh, kind of the, that's the use case we're going for there. Cool, thank you. Okay.